come on up. He is uh, going to be sharing our message this morning, but we have a special announcement uh, that we would like to share. And so um, I'm going to get Hank to, to get started with that announcement. Okay. Yeah. Well, we are excited to welcome Joy Locke with us this morning. Come on up, Joy. She has joined our IHTC team as a, as a licensed therapist. And uh, we're just excited to be able to introduce her to our Summerside congregation because she has agreed to come and serve the Summerside community, not only our own community, but the larger community of, I guess, Prince County. She lives in Queens and currently ministers um, in Queens, but she's willing to come and serve us. So we're pretty excited. So, Very excited, yes. Joy, welcome. So, Joy, what, what brought you to PEI? That's a big question, but I'll do my best to narrow it in. Um, what's that? <laughs> so, about 15 years ago, the Lord put on my husband and my heart this idea of a retreat center. And um, the heart behind that is a place where people can come and encounter Jesus find hope and healing and restoration um, in him. And so in a transitional season two years ago, we felt like, okay, this might be it. And so we came to Prince Edward Island thinking, okay, we're going to put some flesh on the bones of this vision and start a retreat center, including a bed and breakfast, etc. It seems the flesh that we put on the bones, at least for this season, wasn't quite right. Um, and so we are just continuing to walk open-handed and ask the Lord step by step, you know, what, what are we to be doing? And so for me, this past year, it's meant becoming licensed um, to counsel as a therapist on Prince Edward Island. And um, I'm super excited about that. And it all the things that my husband David and I have dreamed in terms of a retreat center, some of those opportunities are coming. A lot of them are coming in different settings than we envisioned. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit. Mm. So you're on the race the Lord called you to yes. run. Right now. Yes. Awesome. So in my clinical experience, mm -hmm. the biggest barrier to people getting help and healing for their deep trauma mm -hmm. is fear of being re-traumatized. Mm -hmm. So I would say to somebody in my office in front of me, you know, you have a, a deep trauma that is affecting your health today. And they would invariably say, it's too painful, can't go there. Mm -hmm. How would you approach that in your practice? Another big question, Hank. I ask big questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so I think you folks are pretty familiar with the word trauma. You're having an event at the end of this month around trauma. But I'll just remind us of what trauma is. And that is an experience in our life where the events, the pain of the events are greater in that moment um, process the pain is greater than we're able to process, process in the moment and for that reason the pain and the hard emotions stay kind of stuck and so when we're wanting to approach trauma for healing it's helpful often to visit the memory and i like to think about it this way so um just rewind for a minute in my counseling, I'm specifically um, a Christian counselor. I, I, I'm passionate about the process of inviting Jesus to guide, direct, and bring healing. And um, imagine for a minute a child who needs to get something in the basement. There's a game or a special toy. But the lights are off and it's scary to go down there. And so what do we do? What, do we not get that toy? Well, one option is to go to a mom or a dad and say, I need something out of the basement and I'm afraid to go alone.
can you come with me? And so, say the dad comes alongside, takes her by the hand, comes down and flips the light on, and with her is able to um, strengthen her to move into the basement and retrieve what's needed. So in this process of counseling that we do, it's accessing the father's strength, capacity, comfort in order to turn the lights on, evaluate um, and process trauma and invite him to bring healing. Mm. So it's really, um, it, my approach would be to create an environment where uh, the person is able to interact with Jesus and find strength and healing in him. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. So we have talked about her starting October, right? First Wednesday, First I think it Wednesday. might be the third. Yeah. And it's not to replace existing ministries under SCC. It's to boost up and to truly create an interdisciplinary team. And, and we're prepared together to uh, tackle tough. Tough things. Tough things, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, it's super exciting. Mm -hmm. So Tracy, I have a question for you. Okay. <laughs> so Christopher Wright... Mm -hmm. um, he's not related to NT, who has become the friend of this house, yes. but he is a British, a British theologian as well, and missiologist. Okay. So he writes in The Mission of God, which is a book about this thick, by the way. It is oh. not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world, but that God has a church for his mission in the world. Mm. The church was made for mission. God's mission. Of course, God's mission is the reconciliation of all things in the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. So here's, here's the leadership question. <laughs> Does Father God, our good, good Father, yes. want his son's body, which is us, the body of Christ, yes. on planet earth to be healthy? What do you think, guys? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A binary question, <laughs> yes or no, right? <laughs> I, would, I was thinking, you know, we've been through the series on the Psalms and the Good Shepherd, the series on the Holy Spirit, who is the one that draws us in all truth. We've been in Romans talking about how the Father sees us as sons and daughters, not as orphans, and the confidence we can have in that. And so, uh, as Hank asked this question, it's a resounding yes, but I was hoping that you would say the same thing in all that you have been hearing and understanding about who we are in Jesus. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. We're the body of Jesus. And of course, he wants us whole. And he's going to use all different kinds of methods to help us get to that place. And so everyone's journey is unique. Everyone's journey is unique. And the most important thing is to get started. And so thank you so much, Joy, for joining us. Mm -hmm. We're excited. For the opportunity. So we'll share ways of reaching her to set up times. Um, it's going to be Wednesday afternoons, Sorry. correct? Yes. Yes. So. Yes. Good. Wednesday afternoons. So yes. Right. Look forward to more. <laughs> Thank you, Hank. All right. So before Hank gets started, um, he has. Um, I guess. Oh, I guess I can use my mic. That would be very helpful because then they can hear me on the live stream. Um, and so. He has put together a really great outline to follow along. He always has such great information for us to take in. So if you didn't grab a bulletin, um, we do have some papers available so you can follow along. So if you'd like one of those, Gordon has those. So just raise your hand and he will bring those to you. So uh, yes, leave your hand raised. It'll just take a few moments to get to you. Um, and while they are doing that, um, I would just like to just pray for Hank before he gets started. So just keep your hands raised. You can leave your eyes open. It's okay. <laughs> so let's pray for our brother. So Jesus, I thank you so much for Hank, God. I thank you for the way that you have wired him and the way that you speak to him. And I just thank you so much for his, his father's heart that cares deeply to see 
uh, the church, his brothers and sisters walk in freedom and wholeness. And so, Father, I pray that the words that you've given him this morning, Father, that he would speak boldly and that we would receive, God, what you have for us and that you, we would recognize in our hearts the things that you are asking of us. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the one that's going to show us, Father, how to step into the, the wholeness that you have for us. So just bless him, I pray, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Do you want to be well? Was the question that Jesus asked the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. But of course, since I ask questions, do you want to be well? Now, I want to acknowledge that this is a weighty question. It's weighty. So before we glibly answer, well, of course, we want to be well. Stay with me, including young people, stay with me as we process the story and the question together. How many of you have seen the chosen of this story? It's season two, episode four. If you haven't seen it as your post-service homework, <laughs> just go watch it because you know, the, 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 the writers and then, of course, the, the whole um, putting together the chosen, they take some, some license, some artistic license in creating a story around the story in the scripture. So my perception, and I've told you before that I always read scripture through the eyes of a physician. So I sometimes will pick up on things that maybe you don't. But, of course, I read this story through the eyes of a physician and now through the eyes of the chosen. So, I want you to know, though, because going through this story together and looking at how we might answer the question may, may hit a raw nerve. And I want you to know that I'm your friend and I am compassionate about seeing people walk in freedom and wholeness. We've already talked about the ground around the cross being level, and I've shared before that we're all bozos on the bus, and I'm a fellow bozo, and, and we're all, as Brennan Manning has said, we're beggars looking for bread. And so in this house, you have heard us share our own vulnerable stories from a self-righteous, proud, judgmental, young, zealous missionary to addictions, to sexual sin, to crashed marriages, and so forth. So we've all been, all of us who've been up here or who will be up here, we've all had our journey, and we share that in order to recognize together we're family. And I would rather present down there from up on this platform. So whatever I share this morning and wherever that lands with you, there is absolutely zero judgment from me on where you are on your healing journey. Zero. But I do invite you to join me and Catherine and I, as we're sharing together, want to invite you on the journey. And young people, the earlier you're on the journey of healing, the less grief you'll experience in your second adolescence, which Tracy, you and I have talked about before, which is the 40s, the wonderful 40s. So please, I really want to encourage you young people, to stay with me and help process this together. A deal? All right. Great. Now, for many of us, the enemy does want to keep us down and sidelined, and as the father of lies, will fill our wounded souls with deception and shame. And we do desire this to be a safe place. Safety is essential. 
So our invitation, Catherine and I, at the end, will be for you to join us in communion together as a step forward on your healing journey. Anne Voskamp wrote in her book, The Way of Abundance, our invitation, sorry, when we battle onward, even when we're broken, all the fixing comes in the moving forward. Let me read it one more time. When we battle onward, even when we're broken, all the fixing comes in the moving forward. If we fall, we got to get up and keep moving forward. So we've already talked about the bulletin. Keep that handy. Scripture says everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. And so the back is sort of a self-examination inventory for self-reflection and confession as we prepare for communion. Now, in this trauma series, and I've had the privilege to share now the third time on trauma, we have been teaching, as Joy has already shared as well, that the imprint of unhealed trauma may still be affecting our mental, physical, and spiritual health today. Now, last time, I introduced this word picture, this metaphor, which is kind of a new thing in my teaching, but it aptly, I think, describes what happens in our nervous system, in our brains, and all the, the attachments to the brain, the nerves, etc., when trauma happens. And at the top, I shared that the electrical lines are the energy source, and the brain runs on energy, and the little girl with the EEG has electrodes, which actually measure electrical activity, so we know there is electrical activity in the brain. And then we also know that there is information being shared between different circuits in the brain, and that is represented by the lower lines, which are the telecommunication lines. And that can be measured now with sophisticated PET scans. And you will see there that there are holes in that brain where the power actually is turned off. So we saw that when there is trauma in the anterior cingulate cortex, which is a key area between our frontal cortex, where our decisions are made, and the limbic system, which is the seat of our emotions. And we saw a couple weeks ago that when there is trauma there and the power goes off there due to a storm, so those electrical wires get knocked down in a hurricane, and when there's a storm and the power is off in that area, there is a blockage of self-regulation, so the limbic system, the emotional part of the brain, stays in a state of fight or flight. And when it stays in a state of fight or flight over a prolonged period of time, that results in all kinds of not only adolescent but also adult illness. Many of the chronic illnesses of adulthood have roots in an ongoing state of fight or flight. And the key mechanism there is cortisone. Then we saw, secondly, that when the cognitive part of the brain, the part that is the thinking part of the brain, and the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain that organizes memories, when that goes offline from trauma, that toxic shame results which we explored last time and results in almost always shame-based or orphan thinking or orphan-mindedness. It leads an opening to the enemy because we're no longer processing what we know to be truth because that part of the brain is knocked offline. 
And so the enemy has a, a place to fill us with his lies that you don't belong, that you're defective, and that you're flawed, and you're not worth it. Now, I want to share a third, third area when the power goes out in the ACC, or the anterior cingulate cortex. You don't need to know the anatomy of the brain. Just recognize that the different circuits in the brain to be a healthy, mature adult need to all be wired together. We call that integration. That's why the name of our ministry has integrated in it. And that's why ministry that, that Aaron does with, with HeartSync, and we are also, Joy does as well, is to take those parts of the circuits that are disconnected by healing the trauma, they become reintegrated, and that's where healing and wholeness happens. And that's the key part of, of, of that inner healing ministry that Ruth does with Sozo, that, that Aaron does with HeartSync, and Joy does with a manual approach, which is a very similar, very gentle way of bringing healing. And if you need, if you have parts of the, the some of your neural networks that aren't clicking on all cylinders, you know where to go, where to come. All right. This is the third one here. This is the third one where now if the ACC is offline, we run into a situation where the filtering of the ACC to distinguish between psychological pain, like you know the, the feeling of a punch in the gut when you experience something psychological, versus the pain of a sprained ankle, normally we can, the ACC can filter those and tell your decision-making part of your brain, this is psychic trauma and this is a sprained ankle. But when that goes offline, that ability to distinguish those is lost and that leads to what we call chronic pain disorders. And I'm gonna illustrate that quickly with a case. This is a case from one of my impairment clinics where I see people regularly with failed outcomes from sometimes very small, low impact injuries. So in this case, this is a, we'll call her Jane Doe. And she was 50-ish, she was fit. She was actually was a fitness instructor and a runner. Um, in 2019, she injured her left shoulder uh, what happened was she was pulling on something and suddenly there was a resistance and she felt something in her shoulder. And she was treated usually by her clinicians with anti-inflammatory and physical therapy. She didn't get better. She ended up with an MRI and it showed a normal rotator cuff, no tear. Uh, because she wasn't getting better, she was given a cortisone shot in her shoulder and that failed. She went to see an orthopedic surgeon who said, well, don't know what's going on, but let's go have a look. So she went to the operating room and had surgery. After that, she developed a frozen shoulder where she couldn't move it at all. And that failed to resolve. So the surgeon took her back for a second operation, this time to try to separate the frozen parts of the joint. And that was unsuccessful and in 2024 she was deemed to be as good as she was going to get with chronic pain seven out of ten and she had lost of motion about 90 degrees she couldn't go all the way and she was unable to return to pre-injury work she can't golf and so why why did she not heal from a relatively simple injury and as Dorothy shared she had thankfully a better outcome <laughs> so exploring this case quickly and this is where our medical system and and I 
be very careful to criti be critical of our medical system, but this is where an exploration of a person's trauma doesn't happen routinely in our health system. And so a surgeon took her to the operating room without knowing or inquiring about this history. She had long-standing anxiety. She has a new partner following a failed marriage with kids. So a blended marriage, typically stressful. Then she told me she had a very dark period in her adolescence and she was hospitalized twice. Now, pre presumably she was suicidal and had two hospitalizations. I didn't explore the details, nor did I need to explore the details of what led to her and her adolescence obviously crashing. But I'm, we can very firmly be assured that she probably had early childhood trauma. So when those are not addressed, simple, small injuries can become lingering chronic pain issues. And 20% of Canadians have chronic pain like that. All right, but there's answers. So let's go to our story. This is the story of another injured man, at least according to the chosen. Um, so let's turn to scripture. Uh, John 5, we'll, we'll look at the story together. And uh, these are pictures from the chosen. John chapter 5, verse, we'll start at verse 2. I'm reading from the NIV. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. By the way, they've excavated this, and, and archaeologists have identified this, and we could go into the background of how it got to be there, but for our purposes... We'll read on. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Now, in The Chosen, they give you the background, which, of course, is, is, is artistic license. They have him falling out of a tree and obviously becoming a paraplegic as a, as a young boy. So with that story, he'd be, guess what, in his 40s. <laughs> when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked, do you want to get well? Now, other translations will say, do you want to be healed? And I think King James says, do you want to be whole? If you have on your Bible app a Strong's, you will see that the word is what we get the word hygiene from. And hygiene, as we'll see, we think of that means cleanliness, but it actually the first definition in Merriam-Webster's dictionary is not cleanliness, it's on health. So a good translation would be, do you want to be healthy? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Now there's a few verses that the NIV has in a footnote that I skipped over. Some versions include those verses. They explain how that water gets to be stirred. And in the chosen, Peter and John are having this conversation toward Jerusalem about the origins of the Pool of Bethesda, and they attribute it to an occult or a rooted in ancient paganism. We don't know. It's the version that says the angel of the Lord, they think, was added later, but that's a whole other discussion. So he says, sir, I have no one to help me into the pool. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. So he does the blame game. Someone else goes ahead of me and leaves me behind. Then Jesus said to him, get up, 
pick up your mat and follow, or not follow me, pick up your mat and walk. Then, of course, there's the whole discussion with the Pharisees who say this is the Sabbath. Jesus kind of disappears, but we pick it up again in verse 14. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen. So that raises another question. What was the sinning this poor fellow might be doing at the pool of Bethesda? Good question. Um, probably not too many bathing beauties to lust after. That's kind of funny. It's okay to laugh. <laughs> it's my imagination. He didn't have the internet, so he couldn't be watching porn. Um, he couldn't order Uber Eats. Probably couldn't rob the bank. Anyway, I'm just letting my imagination go. But the point is, the sins were probably sins of the, of the mind, which, of course, we need to think about ourselves. Okay, so here we go. There's the, the happy guy, and there he's picking up his mat. All right. In about 10 minutes, we're going to cover a couple things. We're going to cover the question, do you want to get well, or do you want to be healthy? Then the answer, I mean, it's a binary question. Yes, I want to be well or no, but maybe the answer is maybe. I'm not sure. So it's probably not a binary question. So what might your answer be to the question if Jesus asks you, do you want healthy? And then, of course, there's that sin that Jesus says to avoid. So... To take our metaphor to this step, the hurricane has come through, knocked down the power, and, and Jesus now is saying, do you want me to fix that or not? The power's down. Do you want me to fix that? And I've already explained that the word hygiene hyge is from the Greek, hygieus, which is what the Greek is in that verse. And the definition is since the sci a science of the establishment and maintenance of health. So a good translation is actually, do you want to be healthy? And so do you want me to send in the Trinitarian utility crew to bring the power back on? So that's, that's the question. That's your question. This, it's the question I'm asking you this morning is do you want to call in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit crew, the word picture taken to the next level, to come and restore the power. And, of course, you need the telecommunications. You need Bell Alliant to come in there as well and put your communications back online. Or are you going to do what a lot of people do? And we did this during Hurricane Juan. Remember Hurricane Juan way back in the day? So we ran an extension cord from our neighbor across the road to our house until we got the power back on. So a lot of people do that to cope. Rather than come back to full power, we make do with half power by plugging in an extension cord. And of course, those are what? Coping mechanisms. And many of us do a lot of life, and young people, many of us old guys have kept that plugged in for 20 years till our 40s. So my message to you is, don't, plug it in, don't leave it plugged in. You may already have an extension cord that is somehow making choices for you because you're not at full power, but get to the place where you actually can unplug that extension cord and bring in the crew to put you back on full power. Now, this is often used as a, you got to plug into the higher power, into God. But this now is, 
is different in this word picture. It's only a coping strategy. So it's not the, the direction I'm encouraging you to go. So the Trinity, Jesus, of course, being central in healing. He said in Luke 4, 18, where he quotes from Isaiah, this is his mission. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And when he sent out the 72, what did he say? Heal the sick who are there. Tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. He links the coming kingdom and healing together every time. Healing in the faith-based project where we as a church family believe in healing is in the context of the kingdom of God. We are declaring that God's kingdom is now and future, but the sign of the kingdom now is that we already have access to Jesus' healing power. So, let's go over, pull out your bulletin. If you got the sheet, and I'm just going to go through these. What are some reasons that we may make a choice to say maybe or no to Jesus' question, do you want to be healthy? And this list is one. I've already said that Jesse in the story of, on The Chosen has blamed the fact that he has nobody to take him into the pool. Um, in the story, his brother, who becomes Simon the Zealot, uh, abandons him. There's no sign of parents in the story. And of course, there isn't any signs that his parents were part of helping him, quotes, get into the pool. So at whatever age he became paralyzed, um, maybe he was abandoned and left for on the street by his parents. We don't know. But the point is, he's blaming his, his lack of community on helping him into the pool. Whether or not the pool really had healing power, whether it was occultic, that's another story. But Jesus comes along and says, do you want to be well? All right, so here's, here's the list. Denial. Anybody in the addictions world knows that number one coping strategy for many addicts is me, an alcoholic, no way. Or I can't keep a job, but it's, it's always the boss's fault. It's never my fault. Denial is such a common way of saying no. It's subconscious. It's subconscious. But it is saying, no, I don't want to get help because I don't want to even admit that I need help. And in our ministry, we always say, and in my practice, I always said, when somebody comes and admits their need, that you've taken the first biggest step on a healing journey, and that is to admit your need. And of course, any of us in 12-step programs, where does it start? I admit that I dot, dot, dot. Number two, this is a big one. Loss of identity. Some of us take on the identity of an illness or a vict as being a victim or being damaged. And when our identity... And I'm going to quote from a book that is not a Christian book, but talks about how important identity is on a healing journey. In returning to your God-given identity. This is a book by Dr. Jeffrey Rediger. It's called Cured. And he has researched what we would call miraculous healings around the world. And he has written a whole book on it. He says, and he writes, when we dig deep into these 
cases of remission that doctors have been, haven't been able to explain, of course, we call them miracles, we see that there is a powerful link between our very identities and our immune systems. Perhaps what ultimately determines the health of the soil of your body is how well you know who you really are at the most authentic level. And we, in the faith community of, of being followers of Jesus Christ, have a good, good father who gives us an identity where we don't have to question the fact that we have a victim and identity or an illness identity. And so language is important. You know, we can say, I am dyslexic and make that my identity. Or I can say, I struggle with a learning problem. I, I have trouble reading because I may be dyslexic. It's, it's the wording. Dyslexia may be what I'm struggling with, but it's not who I am. Not who I am. Same with being a cancer patient. I struggle against this horrible illness called cancer, but I am not the cancer. It may be through me, but it's not who I am. Next is a simple one, loss of compensation. Um, for people who have gained third-party insurance or Canada pension uh, plan, disability insurance, or a veteran who has compensation through Veterans Affairs Canada. Um, there used to be a label in the diagnostic world that we have since removed, but it was called compensation neurosis. Recognizing that when you have a secondary gain as a paycheck, that can be a huge hindrance on your healing journey. See, a lot of this happens subconsciously, and the enemy uses tactics to keep you sidelined and off the race that the Lord has marked out for you. Next one is, well, I can do what I want. I can smoke, and I can... Um, act foolishly because I pay my taxes and the health system is going to heal me if I get sick later anyway. So you're doing a little bit what Jesse in the story of the chosen does. You're, you're blaming or you're putting responsibility on someone else to assist you on your journey toward health and wholeness. Uh, you may have lost hope where medical science has failed you. There are people who have gone everywhere, all over the internet, to clinics all over, in order to find an explanation to unexplained symptoms, maybe chronic fatigue, maybe brain fog, maybe other symptoms, and eventually people give up. There's nothing that will help me, so I need to just carry on and live with what I have. That's called learned helplessness. We know from in the psychology world with rat studies that eventually a rat who has been taught to press a button to avoid a shock will actually give up trying and just sit there and, and endure shocks because the rat has learned helplessness. Next is a word curse. I recently saw somebody in the impairment clinic who had been told after a very minor injury in a nursing home, she's now into her 60s, when she was 20, she had been told by a clinician, you'll never work again. And this was a very minor injury, just a random low back injury. It wasn't even an injury, it was just a, a, you know, a back spasm. And literally, she has not worked again. A word curse. I had a word curse myself. I was told I would never, ever be able to carry a tune, and now I'm not a great singer still to this day. I certainly don't have perfect pitch, but I actually have led worship with Janet in our church in, in Hampton for a few years. So, word curses, be damned. So, quickly onward. 
shame. This is a big one. Shame. I'd rather hide in secrecy than admit my need. I have a porn addiction, but I will I hide it from my wife. I I wouldn't admit it to my men's group, and I just try to cope with it, but I'm not having victory, and so I just hide in shame. Sloth. One of the seven deadly sins. We don't hear much about sloth in our language, do we? Um, we can call it a slumbering spirit. This is where, in a brain scan, most of the villages are offline. So it's a, when a brain is scanned of somebody who is, just has no get up and go, no energy, no willingness to work on themselves in any way, they just kind of give up. Um, it's a slumbering spirit. The power is off in almost all the circuits. And I told you, I think last time, there's at least about nine neural circuits in our nervous system that when they are connected and working together, brings us to a place of mature adulthood. Next is the unbiblical belief that the body doesn't matter. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies do matter. People who might use that excuse say, well, only spiritual disciplines matter. Um, maybe they're over-spiritualized. They don't care for their body because, well, it's just flesh and we're going to heaven anyway, so why bother look after my body? Then there is the occult. Um, being involved in the occult or having idols as a means to try to get well will probably only open the door to other tactics of the enemy. Then... We may blame our genetics, that there's nothing we can do about the genes that we have been given, that it's generational or that it's my, my chemistry that has resulted from my genes. And we now know that less and less is it about our actual genetics, our chromosomes. It's more and more about what we call epigenetics, which is the environment. So genetics are playing less and less of a role in our health than, than the environment, how we live, our early childhood experiences, etc. Then there is lack of obedience. Hosea wrote, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And I always thought before I actually checked the Hebrew that that knowledge must be biblical knowledge or the knowledge of God, knowing God. But actually, it also includes knowledge of the, of the physical realm, which would include science. And now we know how to live more healthily than we did before. I always stand amazed that Jesus, even though he was a busy guy, he never rode a chariot or hire a camel to get around. He had two donkey rides, one before he was born, and one on his way to crucifixion. And so no, no wonder the guy was healthy. Of course, he was the divine son of God. But the point is, if you watch The Chosen, physical activity was a big part of, of life. And what did he eat? Bread and fish. Probably not a bad balance. So, lack of obedience, um, I would rather blank than go for a run or go for a walk. I'd rather eat this than that. Y you can fill in the blank for yourself. And then lastly, uh, geographic therapy, I call it. Um, well, I'm hitting a wall, I'll just move or I have a falling out with my, my wife or spouse or partner, I'll just find another one. Or can't get along with my boss, I'll just go find another job. 
now. Where you are, there you are. But let me say this and listen carefully. God will move you when he has a plan for your life. And Joy's a good example. She got moved here. She wasn't escaping something. She was coming to what God had called her to. It's altogether different when you put geographic therapy to a problem where you're escaping it versus being called to something higher. There's a big difference. All right. So, Scripture says, everyone ought to examine themselves before they come, before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And I'll turn to the passage. So we're going to, we're actually going to have communion together. And worship team, you can come up and get ready to play over us as we get our elements. And Catherine is going to share. Um, but this passage in Corinthians, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So you've had a chance either with a pen or at least in your head to go over that list. And down further, there is also on your sheet those sins that potentially may be hindering you on your healing journey. And I've used my creativity to think of what it was that Jesse, our paralytic, might have been sinning that he was told by Jesus to go away from your life of sin. And Jesus said that frequently to people he healed or people that he ministered to. Now leave your life of sin. So as we are, are preparing to have communion together, just prayerfully consider what it is that you want to confess, and Catherine will lead you in that. So let's, let's stand. And so the way it works now, there's four tables. So we're going to get you to get your elements and come back to your seats and be seated. So this group comes here, and this group goes there, this group goes there, and this group goes here. Is that right, Tracy? Did I get it right? <laughs> All right, so get your elements. So they're going to sing over us the name of the song, N Nothing But the Blood. So listen up to the words as you go, and then come back to your seats. Nothing but the blood of 
So the scripture, Hank read. the scripture that Hank read was, everybody ought to examine himself. This is a personal, this is a self-examination. This is between you and God. You don't have to share it with the whole congregation here. You don't have to share it with the person beside you. This is between you and God. So what do you want to confess? A sin? Forgiving yourself? Forgiving someone else? It's, again, it's a moment between you and God. What perspective do you see yourself through? Do you see yourself through shame lens? Shame says, I'm unworthy. And the resurrection lens says, I am worthy because Jesus' blood paid it all. So what label or false identity do you need to replace with your true identity in Jesus? It's not, the shame says I'm an asthmatic, maybe. But resurrection says I'm a son or a daughter who struggles with allergies. Just want to read some scripture verses from Colossians 3, 1 to 4. Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. And this is why we are to yearn for all that is above. For that's where Christ seats, sits, enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm. Fix your gaze on him. Fill your thoughts with heavenly realities, not with the distractions of the natural realm. Your crucifixion has severed the tie to this life, and now your true life, your true identity, is hidden away in God, in Christ. And as Christ himself is seen for who he really is, who you really are will also be revealed for you are now one with him in glory jesus resurrection was for you if he had gone to the cross for only one human being and it was you or it was me he would do it again we're not just remembering a historical event we are actively recalling his redemptive work and the healing benefits for us as his children in our lives. We are co-crucified and resurrected with him, declaring his victory over our sin, our sickness, our struggles. We serve a living savior his blood has power still. We sing that song. His blood has power still for the many and the one. There's enough power in his blood to cancel any curse, to save us from our past, our present, and our future sins, to remove any false identity or label that we may have owned, and to heal our bodies. And that power has not waned in 2,000 years. It is still alive and well. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Washed in the blood of your sacrifice, your blood flowed red and made me white. His blood is the best stain remover I know there's no stain, no sin too dirty for which his blood has made not made worthy. When we take the body and blood of Christ, we are reminding ourselves whose we are and what he did for all of us. Each occasion of partaking is an opportunity to say and to proclaim and to confess again. I hereby lay hold of all the benefits of Jesus Christ's full redemption for my life, 
forgiveness, wholeness, strength, health, sufficiency. When we take communion, we're reminding ourselves of his sacrifice and the personal and unprecedented ways that this new covenant affects every area of our lives. The blood was shed. The blood that was shed was a covenant for all eternity. It washed us white as snow so we can enter the presence of the Lord without an intermediary and without fear. The blood of Jesus gave us freedom and authority. Hell has been defeated for all eternity. And now we get to boldly release heaven on earth. God wants us to be captains over our inheritance. So let's take the bread. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. That you, thank you that you represent our complete healing. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our sin and our wrongdoing. And the punishment for our well-being fell on him. And by his stripes, we are healed. What a gift. What amazing love and mercy. And we are so humbled and honored to receive such a gift. Thank you, Jesus. Take, eat, and remember. I declare over all of you, that your body, soul, and spirit will be well in Jesus' name. And the cup, washed in the blood of your sacrifice, your blood flowed red and made me white. My dirty rags are purified. I am clean. You are clean. By his blood, we are heirs of salvation, healing, and deliverance. Jesus' blood changed everything for you and me. This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, and that's you and me. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. Thank you for your mercy and your love, Jesus. Thank you that we get to partake in that victory and live forever under the new covenant. Amen. Amen.